so we have been, for the last couple of times together, scouring through the Word of God, looking for mentors. Uh, no matter what it is that you pursue in life, it's always nice to have someone who's been there before, someone who knows the way. John Maxwell said in his book, The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, a leader is someone who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. And in the Word of God, we have mentors, and I thank God for mentors. And so we've not actually been doing a biographical examination of these biblical characters, but rather looking for a single, single distinguishing characteristic that we might apply to our life that if by doing so we might become better and so the first time we looked at David and King David there's so many things to admire about that guy not the least of which his ability with the slingshot you know and I, when I was a kid I wanted to be like King David so I mastered the slingshot not the kind with the rock that you do this but the kind that you do this deadly deadly I was like Jed Clampett I would have to use a mirror to shoot flies off the post at the entryway. You saw that show, right? I was really, I could kill flies with a slingshot, no kidding. And uh, so I wanted to be like David, but uh, so now I've outgrown that part. And I found, I found that David had incredible optimistic faith. He was almost spontaneous in responding to what he thought God wanted to do whenever he delivered the lunch to his brothers. And there was a giant down there taunting, taunting the army of God. David just set the sack lunch down, grabbed a slingshot, waded into the fight and killed the giant. I mean, he almost did it without thinking about it and nobody could talk him out of it. And then when he found out that after he had sinned and fallen with Bathsheba and that God had declared that he was going to kill his firstborn, he actually fasted and prayed and some near him said, why? Why did you do that? Why did you fast and pray even though the judgment of God was upon you and your son was def uh, destined to die? He said, well, you know, after all, God is merciful and awesome in his power. And who knows, who knows, who knows what God may do. Don't you like that kind of faith? I can't wait to get to church on Sunday because who knows what God may do. I just cannot wait to show up on Wednesday evening at Discipleship Wednesday because who knows what God, I just want some of us to get some of that. I'm just thinking in 2013, if I could get some of David's optimistic faith, I might find myself in a, well, who knows? I mean, after all, he is God, and he can do anything he wants to. And, and he's merciful, and he doesn't treat us the way that we ought to be treated. And who knows what he just might do. And then, and then uh, next time, we went forward, and we looked at Apostle Paul. Because we found that a lot of us have been through a lot of junk, right? A lot of us have a lot of regrets. I mean, you don't have to think back very far to dig up and kindle up the regrets from your life, right? And so Apostle Paul, I mean, did he ever have regrets? I mean, he was the guy standing there holding the garments of Stephen, the first Christian martyr, and, St and the Bible said that Paul was consenting to his death. It's like, way to go, thumbs up, let's get rid of this guy. After all, he loves Jesus. And then later on the road to Damascus, whenever he was arrested by God himself and knocked flat of his back and gave his heart to Jesus, then he's like, oh no. I mean, he had to be the rest of his life. I wonder sometimes if perhaps the, the thorn in the Apostle Paul's flesh was not his dimming eyesight or not the pain that he may have experienced as a result of beatings, but rather the memories of innocent individuals that he was responsible for their death just because they loved Jesus. Can you imagine living with that the rest of your life? The problem with the things and our failures and our sins is that we don't forget. God does somehow cast him in the sea of forgetfulness, but we don't ever forget. And if you forget for a moment, Satan says, oh, I remember, you remember, you were bad. And the thing is, even though Apostle, Apostle Paul had all of that in his background, he figured out how to live a life beyond regret. Not a life without regret. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all have regrets, right? But he figured out, he chose, he decided to live a life beyond regret. And so, I mean, I, I, I need to learn something from a guy like that. I got some things I just soon not remember, but they are there just the same. But so what I want to do starting today is live a life beyond regret, right? So we went that far, and today, today we're, going to, we're going to take a look at, a, at like a, one of the most heralded uh, kids' church characters, right? Joseph. You remember Joseph, right? He's the coat of many colors guy, right? Right, and, and here's the thing, here's the thing about Joseph. Joseph, I always love that story because, you know, I mean, I'm an only, I'm an only brother with three sisters, and I read that Israel loved Joseph best, and I'm like, I am like Joseph. I mean, mom and dad both love me best. 
I mean, I, I know it's a fact. I mean, I've got a lot of evidence, but none, none, no more than this. When my mom had a stroke about seven or eight years ago, my sisters called me and said, Oh, Mitchell, mom has had a stroke. You've got to get here. And I ran to the hospital, and they ran outside. The, uh, she's in the emergency room. They ran outside to meet Linda and I as we arrived, and they said, it's, it's as bad as it can be. She doesn't know anything. She doesn't, she doesn't know any of us. And, and, she, and, and I, it was just terrible, and they led me in. And, and I walked in and pulled back the curtain. I said, Hi, Mom. She said, Well, hi, Mitch. <laughs> She said, is Linda with you? <laughs> yeah, that, that's her right there. And, and so then for a while, she was kind of incoherent, didn't make any sense. And later they decided that they would admit her to the hospital. We went upstairs, and that nurse is trying to figure out, says, ma'am, do you know what day it is? And mom said, yes. Well, what day is it? Seven? No, no. She said, do you know what your name is? Mom said, you can call me honey. <laughs> so she pointed my older sister, said, do you know who that is? Next sister, do you know who that is? Next sister, you know who that is? What about him? She said, well, that's Mitch. <laughs> so I really could relate. I could really relate with a guy like Joseph because... Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, he loved him best. I mean, he had, he had 11 brothers, and even a baby brother, Benjamin, but he was the favorite. It, it, they always made it such a wonderful story, and, and I always loved that. And he had that coat of many colors, and the artist in me, I wanted a coat like that. Someday I may get me a coat like that. With all them colors and stuff. But the th point of it is, nobody, they didn't tell the whole story. The thing that I like about the Bible is that the Bible tells the whole story. Remember when we started this series, we said that? Remember Jason Upton's song, Write Every Day Down? Write Every Day Down. That's the whole, write every day down, write every day down, write every day down, write every day down. That's the words of the song. But then he said, thank God. He said, thank God for David. And thank God for Jonah. And thank God for Adam and Eve. They all had the courage to tell the whole story. God give us the strength that we need to write every day down. So whenever they wrote down the whole story of the descendants and the offspring of Israel and Joseph's family, that was a messed up family. I mean, I mean whenever Jacob w went down to Laban's house and, and he saw Rachel, Rachel is the one that lighted off her camel. She didn't light a camel, she lighted off her camel. She... He saw her down there drawing water, and, and he was smitten with her. She was beautiful, and so he worked out a deal with Laban. He would work seven years for Rachel. That's how you got married in those days, guys. <laughs> and so he worked seven years, and so, but, but, but whenever, he, whenever the deal was done, and, and Laban gave him a daughter, and, and he went in and, 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 and consummated the marriage, he woke up the next morning, and it wasn't Rachel. It was Rachel's oldest sister, Leah. That, that's a fine way to start the marriage. And so he goes in and complains. I, I asked for what was behind the curtain. I got what's behind the door. <laughs> I am not satisfied. <laughs> and so Laban said, no problem. But here we have, a, we, we, have a, uh, we have a pattern. We have a tradition. And that is the oldest daughter has to be married first. So if you want Rachel, you can have her too. But you have to work seven more years. He worked seven more years for Rachel. And so we find out in Scripture that, Laban, or that, that Jacob actually loved Rachel best. So now he's got two wives. I mean, that's a mess right off the bat, right? The Oak Ridge boys said trying to love two women is like a ball and chain. One has my money, the other has my name. It's a long old grind, and it tires my mind. <laughs> you didn't know I knew the words of that, did you? I'm in, I'm in so much trouble. Yes, bless him, Lord. And, but the thing of it is, is he loves Rachel best, and so now there's a contest between the two girls, the two sisters, to see who can have babies the fastest, because in that day, having babies is a good thing, and being barren is not. And lo and behold, Le 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 Leah has the first baby, and Rachel is falling behind, so she has an idea, and she has a personal servant, a woman, she sends her in to be concubine, and so, to have, so, so Jacob is having babies by his two daughters and by their two servants. And so Jacob has all these, I mean, jo Joseph has all these half-brothers. It's a mess. I mean, it's a mess. And so finally, finally, the tenth son that is born is born by Rachel. God has mercy. And Rachel finally has a son, and his name is Joseph. And now you got the picture. And so Israel loves 
Joseph best. And guess what the rest of the family feels about the fact that mom likes Mitchell best. <laughs> it is not popular. We don't talk about it at family reunions. I don't rub it in. I don't bring it up. Because, and the reason I don't is because I'm smarter than Joseph. <laughs> Joseph is prating around in a coat that on the back that says, I'm daddy's favorite. He's the only one with the multicolored coat. It isn't bad enough. I mean, that is a messed up family. You know it is a messed up family when you play favorites with your kids. You know it is a messed up family when you got, when you got kids by this wife and kids by this wife and kids by that handmaiden and kids by this handmaiden and they're all together and you pick out one, say, I love that one the best and give him a coat that says this is the favorite. And so, so the, the rest of the boys hated this guy and, and like all of that isn't enough it really begins to escalate. I mean, I, I don't even have time to tell you all that went on. If I, if I did, if I did, it would take way too long. But let's just suffice it to say he came from a terrible family. And it says in Genesis 37 and 3, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. And it should have mentioned he was also the son of Rachel. And he also made him a tunic of many colors. And that was not a good thing. And then the ten brothers that were born, they complained about the whole deal. And they actually got to the place that they hated their brother, it says in verse 4, but when their brothers, when his brothers saw that their father loved him more. My sisters know. It is not a secret. And they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers. He, he, he should have just, I'm just speculating, he should have kept it to himself. But I don't know if he should, you shouldn't amen that. But he, but he, but he, it caused more problems. That's the thing. Now Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers and they hated him even more. So he said to them, please hear this dream which I've dreamed. We were binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf rose and also stood upright. And indeed your sheaf stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, even his brothers could interpret that dream. Are you kidding? It says, and his brother said, you shall reign over us or you shall have dominion over us. So they hated him even more. I mean, this thing is escalating for his dreams and now his words. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers. And they and said, look, I have dreamed another dream. And they said, oh, well, let us hear it. <laughs> And this time the sun and the moon and the eleven stars bound down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come and bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him. But his father kept the matter in mind. Here's, here's what I really want to talk to us about today. I want to talk to us about the diligent dreamer. Not just the dreamer, but the diligent dreamer. This guy, Joseph. Born the 11th of 12 brothers, despised, literally despised by his brothers. Ultimately, you know the story. They conspired to kill him, yielded to the advice of one of the older brothers, and instead sold him into slavery. Joseph then would overcome many obstacles and wait many years. Theologians speculate that Joseph was about 18 at the time that he was sold into slavery. He would be about the age of 30 by the time he finally ascends to become the second and arguably, and some might say, the most powerful man in all of Egypt because Pharaoh put everything in his hands. I think Pharaoh kind of went on vacation, to tell you the truth. He gave him his ring, his signet, and gave him authority to do every single thing in the land. So he became incredibly powerful. But 12 years passed, and he went through a lot of hardship. I, I want us to begin this so that we have a common ground together. Because one of the things that I know, in that the way that God assembles a body of believers together to minister to the unique grouping of people in our harvest field. He brings people from every walk of life and every imaginational, every imagination and every background and every skill set 
and, 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 and in the case of this church, it's really amazing because the, the variety of skills and the variety of attitudes and the variety of opinions and, and all the, the diversity that exists just here in this congregation, God is at work in all of that and he brings us together. And, and you're not just simply here to kind of hang on. You're not here to be a part of the crowd or the congregation or the community, but you're actually here to be a part of the committed and part of the core and to be a difference maker. And some of you actually know that there's a dream stirring in you. You sense that there's something more. C.S. Lewis said dreams are gifts from God. They are his way of saying there is more. And some of you sense there is more. Brother Raven, I remember when God first called me to preach, when he was first dealing with me about this calling, it did not even make sense. I had no idea what was coming, but I was teaching a Sunday school class in those days. And a lot of times in my, at moments of, of, of candor and transparency in front of my class, I would say I sense that God is calling me to something more. It just seems. It just feels. You know what I'm saying? There's a stirring. I'm just not comfortable where I was. I don't quite belong where I am, and I don't know where I'm supposed to go. I mean, some of you already know what I'm talking about. Some of you are already able to lift your hands and look around and say, boy, they need some help over there. Somebody ought to take care of this. I don't see why somebody doesn't pick that up. Somebody ought to fix this. Somebody ought to clean that. And, and you look around, and you see things that ought to be done. And God is already stirring. There's a dream being birthed in you. You might have actually said it to somebody. I, I don't want to jump to a conclusion, but I'm telling you right now, depending on who you said it to, if you actually happen to have either, if, you're, if your loved ones, if your spouse, if they might be uh, either unsaved or, or spiritually arrogant and high-minded, either one, they might have already kind of mocked you for it. <laughs> you're kidding. You think God could actually, you really? Uh, why are you attending that leadership class? What's that all about? What do you think? But the reality is there's a dream stirring, but I want you to hear this. I don't want you to allow your dream to be minimized because of where you have been. The dream is not about the past. The dreamer is never about, the dream is never about where you've been. It may have something to do with what you've gone through and what you have experienced, but the dream is not about going back. Uh, uh, Israel Houghton said, I'm not going back. I'm moving ahead. I'm here to declare to you that my past is over. And some of you need to recognize that all of the things that God has brought you through, yes, you came through them. Yes, they are a part of your past, but your past does not equal your future and your dream is a matter all of its own. I, I want to say it again. Your dream is a matter all of its own. Listen, I believe that God has lofty dreams and God has dreams for this earth and dreams for mankind and dreams for his kingdom and dreams for his universe. God has a great mind. It's clearly an active, busy mind, but your dream is personal. Your dream was given to you by God. It doesn't have anything to do with your neighbor. It does not have anything to do with your past. It does not have anything to do with your limitations. It doesn't have anything to do with your barriers. It is your dream and God has placed it in you for a purpose. So what you have to recognize is that you are at a wonderful, beautiful, defining moment. So jo uh, Joseph perhaps shared his dream because of his excitement. He might have shared his dream because he felt like that it was a gift from God and he ought to share it. Sometimes we share things with people who we think actually love us. I think that jo Joseph was naive that his brothers hated him. I mean, he seemed to want to be around them. Whenever his father would send them, he would go. He went without resistance. I don't think he necessarily picked up on all of that and he probably told them the dream because he just wanted them to know he was excited and that's fine but I want you to hear this it does not your dream does not require the approval of your peers <laughs> some of you are getting this also your dream does not require any resources never allow your dream to be categorized by the abundance of your resources God is a sending God, and whenever God singles you out and sends you whatever is required to perform the task, it will be in your hand at the moment required because God is not a I'll try it and see if it'll work kind of God. God always sends men to succeed. You will not fail if you pursue your dream. So, so, so Joseph is sold. First of all, he ends up in the pit. I believe there's a pattern to this process. 
of laying hold of our dream. And, and maybe, maybe I'm, I, I'm being guilty of spiritualizing things that are not spiritual. I think the pit itself is symbolically used a lot of times as a place of containment, a place where Satan puts people who are on their way to their destiny to make sure they never get there. Uh, we find that, that, uh, that David himself said that he lifted me up out of the pit and placed my feet upon a solid rock. We find that, David, uh, that Joseph's brothers put him into a pit and they meant to put him in there and they never meant for him to ever come out alive. They put Peter in prison to cut his head off and the scripture says in the book of Acts, and Peter therefore was kept in prison. And Satan has put many of you in a place where you are, you're behind the eight ball. You're not making enough money to make ends meet. You got a job that's a dead end job. You got uh, insufficient resources. It seems you need a little more education. You got this barrier and that. You're in a pit. It's walled. You don't have a ladder. There's no way out. And Satan, and I want you to know that being in a pit is a part of the process of getting from here to your dream. Now that's news for some of you. You are kidding. Being in the pit is part of the will of God. Well, I think so. I'm just saying I think so. It seems to me like pit is part of the process. I didn't even rehearse that or plan that. I thought. So the three Ps. The pit is part of the process. So thank God for where you are and understand that this is a temporary place. I don't want to be clever with this, but I want you to realize that God has ordained times and seasons. The wise man Solomon said there's times and seasons for every purpose under the heaven. And you know one of the things that we know about time, it's fleeting and seasons change. And we know that no season lasts forever. You ought to look at your neighbor and say, no season lasts forever. You're not going to be in the pit forever. You're not going to be stuck here forever. It seems like a permanent condition. Can somebody say, man, it seems permanent, but it's not. It's just a season. And so for a season, he was in the pit. He went from the pit to Potiphar's house. I hate to mention that he went from Potiphar's house to prison. <laughs> My God is also a God of the alphabet. He thinks of everything. Some of you are actually going to remember this in spite of me. He went to Potiphar's house. There's something that I want to point out to you on this journey. I mean, when he went to Potiphar's house, he went as a slave. Now, this is hard to imagine that there's such thing as a low-level slave, but he was a low-level slave. He was at the bottom end of slavery. He was a kid. He was brought into Potiphar's house, and immediately he demonstrated in a circumstance that was not of his choosing. My God, if everybody in the church will get a hold of what I've got in me, it would transform us. He didn't want to do what he was doing. He didn't want to be where he was. He was not on assignment. He didn't feel like he was being called. At this point, his whole life has been interrupted, derailed. He begged his brothers, don't kill me. Begged his brothers, don't put me in the pit. They put him in the pit and sold him into slavery. Now he is in this, this man's house who is a ruler directly under Pharaoh. He's one of Pharaoh's uh, officials. And he's in this guy's house. And what, what do you think happens? He looks around and sees stuff that needs to be done. And he just starts doing it. He begins to improve this man's living conditions. I, I don't know what he did. He might, have, he might have moved things around. He might have done some painting. He might have just been a good... I don't know what it was. But he began to take such good care of the man's... He noticed. He just noticed. He noticed his endeavors. He noticed his energy. He noticed his commitment to excellence. He noticed his faithfulness in service. And this guy, before too long, he promotes him. And he's over all the slaves at his household. I, I'm not minimizing the fact that he's a slave. But all of a sudden, he's in charge of Potiphar's house. Well, it isn't too long until temptation comes along. And, and I, I just need to throw this out to you. But whatever you're doing, whatever your pursuit, temptation is always going to be raising its ugly head along the way. There comes a point for some of us, if you're going, listen, if you're going to fulfill your God-given destiny, at some point you have to be willing to run toward your dream and run toward your destiny and run away from temptation. I'm telling you right now, I'm just venturing to say... Do you ever wonder how a guy like Harry, Henry Kissinger can ever find a woman? 
It's because of the way that we rate men. Henry Kissinger is beyond homely. But he's a former Secretary of State. So when you look on the how good looking is Henry Kissinger chart, on a scale of 1 to 10, he may be a 3. And I'm probably being very generous. But he may be a 3, but then you throw in former Secretary of State, and he becomes a 9. And really good looking women are attracted to guys like Henry Kissinger. I'm just saying. I'm speculating that Potiphar's wife was a pretty woman. I'm just speculating. And the Bible even says that Joseph was a handsome man. And she started putting moves on that guy that a lot of you guys would have a hard time resisting. And finally she caught him alone. And at that moment he had a decision to make. Do I enjoy pleasure for a moment? And Potiphar will never have to know. And after all, I'm just a slave. How can it get worse than this? And instead, he slipped out of his coat. She grabbed his coat. He slipped out of his coat and ran toward his dream. Ran toward his destiny. I'm just simply saying to you, if you are not diligent in avoiding temptation, if you are not diligent in being faithful in small things, whatever your assignment, even if you're working in a place where you don't want to be and doing things you would rather not do, if you are not faithful, you will derail your own destiny and the dream will never become a reality even though it's the plan of God. He slipped out of his coat. She turned him in, accused him of rape. He ended up in prison. Now, now that's a great assignment. He's a slave in prison. And when he shows up there, he saw things that needed to be done. And he began to do them. He did them with such excellence that it got the attention of the prison master. And the prison master, however high you can go in prison and still be a prisoner, that's how high Joseph was. Now you have to understand what he was doing. He was in a dungeon with chains and violent criminals. He was in a bad place where none of us would want to be. The business was cleaning. He was not in there with a little tidy bowl and a brush. He was emptying the slop cans. He was cleaning out the ditches filled with human waste and urine. He was doing the things that nobody would want to do, but he diligently went about the process. And in doing so, he gained the respect of the fellow prisoners and the attention of the prison master. And before too long, his name was mentioned before Pharaoh. I'm just simply saying, I'm not going to tell you the story. I want to bring this to a quick conclusion and tell you this. If you will lay hold of the dream that God has in your life, Everybody I meet, I, I mean, I, I just run into people that they just want to do something really big for God. I tell you what we're going to do. I mean, I run into them all the time. People are not satisfied. If they can sing good, they're not satisfied to sing good on Sunday morning at the local church. They want a bus and a 10-piece band, and they want to go on the road and sing to 30,000 because they feel like God has called them to something great. It's the most interesting thing. Everywhere you look, there's somebody in the black sea of sin that is drowning for lack of hope, and all you've got to do is reach over the boat and get somebody and pull them in but nobody wants to do that everybody wants to go on the road and do something grand and until you are faithful in doing the smallest things and the seemingly insignificant and the mundane until you are faithful in rejecting temptation God will never call you into the palace you'll never move from slavery to being second in command until you become faithful and diligent in the small things in the kingdom That's the lesson. That's the lesson. I have people come by the gallery on a regular basis. They see the gallery that God has blessed Lynn and I with in Berea. 10,000 square feet, 8,500 square feet in a town of 9,000 people. It's, the gallery is way too big for that size town. It was just God's doing. And people come by and they say, man, I've been drawing since I was a child. How can I... Get to where you are. So it's, it's easy. It's easy. I did 20,000 drawings by the time I was 18. My first year in college, I did 600 drawings a day for a year. That's not 600 drawings in a year. 600 drawings a day for a year. Whenever they call you to sit on Jimmy Carter's patio and to do his portrait, you know what bails you out? Not trying hard. I meet people all the time say, I'm just going to try my best. Trying is nothing. You ever tried trying? <laughs> Let's do this. This is an experiment. Are you ready? Watch me try to lift my foot. 
Do you see it? Trying is nothing. This is called lifting your foot. Trying is nothing. See, I'm just going to try. When you sit down on the patio to do Jimmy Carter's portrait, you don't do a good job because you tried. You do a good job because you trained. How to preach. Some of you are not ready to step up to the king's palace because you are more cut out for Sunday morning than you are for Discipleship Wednesday. So Discipleship Wednesday, that's just for the little people. Yeah, it may be, but I can tell you right now, some of the Wednesday people, they're going to find a sweetheart today at the banquet. <laughs> and you're going to die old and lonely. Now, I'm just simply saying, God is watching the faithful few who are diligent in the Word, workmen that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Those who will dig in and go in the prayer closet and close the door and pray in secret so the Father who sees in secret will do what? Reward you in an open and a public way. You're not going to get the public and the open reward until you do the seemingly insignificant private things that nobody in the world knows anything about except God. And so it came down to the end and everything changed. You probably thought I was just preaching a lot of tollisms there, but it says in Proverbs 18, 16, a man's gifts makes room for him and brings him before great men. Proverbs 22 and 9, do you see a man who excels in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before unknown men. You know what the Bible is saying? It's inevitable. If you're faithful in the small things, it's inevitable. He will make you ruler over larger things. If you're faithful in the mundane and the insignificant, it's inevitable. That's what he's saying. You will not continually and endlessly, the seasons will change. And before too long, God will be using you to rescue the lost in the highest places of city government in the, in, across this town. In, the, in, in those who sit on the corporate boards of the banks and the large corporations. Those who need Jesus, but we won't approach them because it looks like they have everything. They do have everything except salvation for their souls. And God will elevate you to that place but only when you've been faithful and excelling in your work and doing the insignificant. It says in Proverbs 10 4, He who has a slack hand becomes poor, but the diligent, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. By the way, if you really study that word there, it's really not so much applying to give you a lot of silver and gold. It says really if you are slothful, you'll never amount to anything, but if you are diligent, God will give you abundant resources that will make you effective in the kingdom. He'll not withhold anything from you if he finds that you are diligent and faithful in the small things. Let me go to the end. I think you can expect on your journey to pass through the pit. I think you can expect the containment and the isolation and the loneliness and the filthiness of prison. You'll pass through that. And I think ultimately that you will experience the intensity and the intent of temptation. There are a lot of you that still believe that the rules of the church and the rules of God are too hard because the problem is we just don't want you to have any fun. But what you'll figure out on the journey to your dream is that the temptations are that come your way are not to give you fun, but to destroy your destiny. So you'll figure that out. So you will be tempted. You will be isolated and alone. You will be contained and imprisoned. You'll pass through those seasons on the way to your destiny. But those who endure, it says in Genesis 50, 19 through 21, this is after it's all finished, and the brothers have finally showed up and been living in Goshen, and now their father has died. And after their father has died, they get alone together one night and have a powwow, and they say, we are in trouble now. Joseph has brought us here into this land and kept us, and daddy is dead, and now we are going to have to pay for what we did because he is so powerful. But Joseph said to them in verse 19 of Genesis 50, do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them 
and spoke to them kindly. In retrospect, Joseph was able to look back and say all those things that I went through, the pit, Potiphar's house, the prison, I, I know that you guys hated me, and I know you meant to do me harm, but give yourself a break. It was all the plan of God. It was all necessary in order for me to lay hold of my dream. So we can say, as Paul said in Romans 8 and 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. So many of you are cradling dreams. They are obscure at this time. The interesting thing about a dream is a dream is just that. It's a mental image, a picture of how things could be instead of how they are. It's lacking in detail. Joseph never had any idea how it would be that his brothers would bow to him and what the circumstances would be. When he interpreted the dream for Pharaoh and explained to him about the coming years of plenty and famine, he had no idea how he figured into that when he interpreted that dream. He was just faithful in the small thing. See, there's an interesting thing is that when God holds a dream for you, if you embrace it, it gives purpose to your activity. I, I, I don't just avoid sin because I'm disciplined and I'm more disciplined than someone else. I avoid sin because it would interrupt the dream, the plan that God has over my life. You see how it changes everything? The craziest thing, craziest thing, I don't even know if you'll connect these dots. I hope you will. It's the craziest thing because I tried all my life to make a living as an artist. I mean, from the time I was three. I, I, I would do your portrait for a dollar when I was 12, and, and it looked like you. But not many people wanted to spend a dollar to have a little boy draw their picture. I, I didn't know how to make it pay. I was 30 years old. By the time I was 30, that dream of making a living as an artist was a thousand miles away. I, I couldn't lay hold of it. I couldn't lay hold of it. And then one day, uh, the author, Alex Haley of Roots fame, came into my life. And he said this to me, and it was a wake-up moment. I, I believe God sent him into my life. I, I say that humbly but I say it because I believe that he did he was signing autographs and looked very weary and uh, he looked exhausted and I found out he hadn't slept in 48 hours I was there standing beside him and people were pressing in to get autographs and I asked him do you ever get tired of this and he didn't answer for a long time he looked at me and stared at me and in the silence tears filled his eyes I was standing Tony our noses were this close where the crowd was pressing in and I saw the water filling up in his eyes until his eyes were full and then tears streaked down across his black face and I didn't know if I'd said something to offend him and this is what he said of course I get tired but this is my destiny he said my greatest fear is that I could have lived and died never knowing why I was here but I know. And with that, he looked at me and said, and you know too. Well, I was 34, and I didn't know. And that thing that he said to me wouldn't go away. And I began asking, who am I and why am I here? And why does my work matter? I mean, it was, I was 34 years old. I just want to say that to you before I really said, what's this about? Why me? Why now? A provoking question, right? But some of you are wrestling with that right now. And there is this dream, this dream that just won't go away. You know, sometimes you eat too much pizza and you have dreams, but they go away. But there are some dreams, at 63, I've learned this, some dreams linger. They just don't go away. And sometimes they inspire you and sometimes they fire up your passion, Heather, and sometimes... And sometimes they, they make you afraid because they're audacious and you feel unqualified. I told the crowd on Wednesday night that 
Just a few years ago, someone interviewed Billy Graham, and they said, if you had known, if you had known all this would have happened to you in your life, is there anything you would have done different? And he said, yes. I would have been more prepared. I'll tell Billy and I'll tell you, you don't have to be more prepared. All things do, in fact, work together for good to those who are the called. He is preparing you. All of your circumstances and all of the barriers and all of the pits and all of the prisons and all of the temptations that have happened to you to this point, they've all been by His divine intent to prepare you. So what you do is you pursue. You yield. You become faithful. See, some of you need to repent for your unfaithfulness in the small things. As a church of our size, we need volunteers. We need volunteers. We, I could use 50 right now. We need them in kids' church. We need them in the nursery. We need them in the teen department. We, we, need, we need them in the choir. We need them in the media booth. We need them on the yard crew. We need, them, we need volunteers. Oh, but, you know, yeah, I know you're way too important for that. But the problem is we don't have enough important jobs to go around. And so God runs us all through the pit and the prison and the intentional temptations that Satan brings into your life to prepare you. So you're going to have to go through this in order to serve the house.